thought out and detailed is from the government think tank called Niti Aayog, which came out with a discussion paper on AI in 2018, uh, putting out the tag of AI for all. And that was followed or uh, first went to discussions uh, in 2020 with a set of principles that they recommended on responsible AI. And that was accompanied with something. Uh, uh, it was, again, at the stage of a discussion document, so it's not binding, but they recommended an enforcement framework of a sort, which uh, basically the emphasis was around thinking about this at this stage in the Indian market from a uh, self-regulatory perspective and not from any kind of binding regulation which would impede innovation. So that that's been the flavor of the way the Indian government has been thinking. and But they did talk about the need for risk-based regulation, which would be kind of proportionate to the kind of issues being posed. So they talk about the general principles, which the UNESCO, as well as several principles, other principles talk about things like privacy, security, fairness, uh, avoiding bias, etc. But to operationalize all of this, they kind of put the main obligation on the industry or the operators themselves. And this, they suggested a kind of an enforcement framework, but which would be multi stakeholder regulatory but it is it doesn't have teeth in the recommendation in terms of it's not a legal framework it is more in the advisory uh, advocacy you know reframing the principles looking at compliance putting out standards so it is more a soft touch approach uh, which has been recommended and that's where we are at. We're so, as I said, we are uh, still far away from thinking about binding regulations, not only on AI, but we still don't have a binding law on data protection, which many see as the you know first step uh, towards AI. But just to add on the data governance part, there is a conversation going on around how do you make more data available uh, for AI research, and there again. Uh, uh, you know, that's something we don't have binding legislation on, but there are proposals from the government to kind of open up non-personal data to begin with, both which is held by the government as well as which is held by the private sector so that this becomes available for AI research. So I'll stop with that. Thank you, Smirichi. Uh, Wayne, please. Okay. Okay, so uh, hello everybody. As Mana in so we won. You can call me wine. And thank. Uh, I mean, I would like to express thanks to Savita and Alessandra for the invitation. And I'm going to, today I'm going to share with you a very big picture about the uh, so-called AI governance framework in China. Uh, basically, we have to admit that we have the governance model for AI and data globally. Um, for example, as I uh, if I'm correct, I think they, uh, Oxford uh, held a conference titled The Race to Regulate AI in the Middle of uh, 2022. Uh, they proposed that uh, there are at, le at least uh, three approaches to regulating artificial intelligence, for example, like in European Union and Brazil here. Um, uh, 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 we have the kind of only bus AI law. And we also regulate artificial intelligence through data protection for the input through GDPR. Uh, and they, uh, like uh, China, it's not specific jurisdictions, who have signed uh, algorithm uh, specific uh, views or acts or legislations. So what is the real Beijing model of artificial intelligence uh, uh, governance? Um, we proposed uh, that it's kind of a hybrid thing, uh, namely the Angel AI governance. The Angel governance model was even proposed in Japan's uh, uh, industry, for t industry 4.0 strategy, I think. So it's not a new idea. Um, in terms of the Chinese context, actually, um, AI is representative of the state uh, top-down uh, top idea in China where science and technology are fairly and originally embedded in the, na in the national laws as a governance tools driving the economy to grow faster. So uh, the Chinese, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, government, uh, I mean, the, the Chinese framework basically um, uh, aggregates training data for AI by encouraging the larger uh, uh, population to participate in its uh, digital transformation. For example, in 20, uh, since 2015, uh, we, have, uh, we have had the uh, Made in China 2025 plan and the Internet Plus initiative. And uh, uh, in 2017, there is a very formal uh, document named the New Generation AI Development Plan setting the uh, AI commercialization or marketplace 
plays a goal. And in the very recent years, uh, two years, uh, China established the Ch National uh, New Generation Artificial Intelligence Governance Committee. It's a kind of a centralized, but uh, 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 but multi-stakeholder oriented uh, uh, body. And it all, uh, this body introduced the ethical framework for new generation artificial intelligence. And also they, uh, in to, uh, this year, the General Office of the State Council released the opinions on strengthening scientific and the technological ethical governance, and it relates to uh, 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 artificial intelligence as well. So, China, so over, I mean, generally speaking, China regulates AI from two perspectives. The one is from the hard law, and the other is the soft law. So I have mentioned a lot of AI incentive, uh, incentive national strategies. So that's a kind of the soft law perspective, but also China also regulates AI from a lot of um, hard law legislation. For example, the data protection, uh, the personal information protection law and uh, the amended uh, anti monopoly law, customer law, e even e-commerce law. And uh, also China has introduced uh, some algorithm specific uh, legislation, for example, the prevention on internet you know, information service algorithmic recommendation management. It relates to the recommendation system. Be, uh, I mean, algorithm-based uh, recommendation systems. Uh, uh, so I think, and uh, for example, in the uh, the personal information protection law, it's Article Twenty Four and Twenty Five uh, regulates uh, the. Uh, um, Automated decision making by some bigger platforms. Uh, okay, and even from the uh, in the courts, there is a very some cases relating to artificial intelligence as well. The biggest uh, one is the I I I versus Biden. It fixed on the platform liability and algorithmic aggregation of contents. So uh, there is a soft uh, the approach is uh, hard law process soft law. I think I will stop here in turn, to save time. Thank you. Uh, now our floor speakers, uh, Thiago, please. Um, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, I want to see if I can share my screen for a very short presentation. Uh, let me... Just test it. Is it sharing the screen? Uh, I don't know. Yeah? Yes. Okay. So uh, I will just bring, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank for the opportunity to be here as a representative of the Brazilian Data Protection Authority. But my role today will be, will be to show a, a bit more of the general overview of how this is being discussed in Brazil. So basically, uh, the debate so far uh, has been following uh, both uh, national and also we are looking at international level. Uh, so we are following uh, as an observer member, uh, what are the discussions going the OECD work, uh, working group, working party on AI. Uh, but nationally, we also have some uh, initiatives regarding a national strategy and also uh, AI uh, bill that's being discussed. So going step by step, Talking about the OECD, it's a very interesting opportunity so we can follow uh, how this governance discussion model is, is, is being held in several other regions. And uh, we, uh, we, are even, we even have a version of our national strategy uh, available in the OECD AI policy observatory. So in case you want to see, there are also some use cases that have been tested so far. I'm not so sure how many of those are in English, but well, for now we could uh, go with the translator systems of the AI translator systems available online. It might help. Uh, anyway, talking more about the national perspective, in 2020 uh, there was a AI strategy that was uh, created, and it has three transversal vert uh, horizontal axes, and six vert vertical ones. I won't go deep into them, but the idea is that the transversal axis look for how legislation, regulation, uh, responsibility, ethical use would 
uh, assist on the several sectors that we want to focus, like education, productivity, public sector, public security. And then we come to the Congress and how uh, there's the discussion going on regarding the creating of abiding regulation. So there are several bills that has been going on, but the main one is this one in orange, uh, the 20, number 21. And since then, uh, a committee of experts was selected so they could uh, uh, provide a, a draft bill and this, uh, this, uh, since it was uh, organized, they created, uh, they organized some public hearings, so it could have some multi-stakeholder approach, and they also were somehow concerned with a bit of race and gender diversity to see some issues that might be particular to well, the, the the reality of Brazil, the socio-economic reality of Brazil. So several axes were considered. And uh, as part of the public hearing, there were some discussions of what would be the governance model in terms of oversight. So who will regulate or how it will be regulated, the, the, how it will be enforced, this legislation. There were several proposals, some that even came just with sectorial approach or auto-regulation by companies. But as you can see, the model number five is an idea that considered that uh, due to the uh, transversality of AI systems, uh, at some level, many regulators will have some, some authority to, to deal with the situation, but some coordination is needed. So maybe some central authorities should exist for that. But I, ha I want to make it very clear that everything here is just proposal so far. So we are actually expecting that by the end of this year, uh, the, the committee of experts that has gathered all this information will bring this proposal. So we are curious to see if uh, model number five will be the one proposed or a different one. And for sure, uh, the discussion will still go on for some months or maybe years because it's a very challenging topic. And that's it. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. can pass it to Mobina, please. Um, all right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for having me be a part of this panel. My name is Bobina Zufa, and I am from Uganda. I work with a, a, civil, a civic tech organization called Policy, and I'm a data and digital rights researcher with them. So I was, um, you know, like my colleagues have been doing, you know, invited to give an overview of what AI legislation looks like from Uganda. But um, I feel the need to instead go and uh, go ahead and give an Africa-wide perspective because what's happening in Uganda is too, too small, unfortunately, to paint a picture that I feel would be adequate. And that's also a representation of what much of what is happening across the continent in terms of AI regulation. And so I'll just go ahead and, you know, just go over Africa as a whole. So, um, like I said, um, unfortunately, progress in terms of AI legislation uh, um, it, it, it's what's happening is very, very uh, little. Progress is too slow in terms of AI legislation. And, um, you know, this is using a number of indicators. For example, when you look at national AI strategies, there is only about um, six countries which have a national AI strategy across Africa. Um, looking at, um, you know, uh, AI legislation as a, as a whole, only one country has um, what you'd call um, you know, AI legislation, and that's Mauritius, but that's still happening, you know, sort of partially. But also just looking at, um, you know, um, is there white papers that are being written by the countries? There is just, you know, very few countries that are doing any of that. So basically, I would say a lot of what's happening across Africa in terms of AI legislation is just... Um, from a perspective of um, data protection. And this is also looking at uh, in comparison with the UN uh, UNESCO recommendations. So across a number of those principles, um, really the only thing that's being addressed right now is um, personal data protection. And this stems from you know um, the top down. So that's coming from the AU, the African Union. So what you find still happening at the AU level is, um, for example, looking at data protection, we have the Malabo, um, 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 the Malabo Convention, and this was 
2014, but up until now, it hasn't been ratified because only 13 countries have signed to it and uh, there is a necessity of at least 15 countries to sign this off until it's ratified. But at least um, that has taken shape in uh, the form of a number of African countries now do have um, data protection laws and data protection authorities. But um, we still see that that's only happening right now at about 55% across the continent. Um, but besides that, uh, you know, what I would say the other thing happening is um, the African Commission for Human and People's Rights, ACHPR, has um, a resolution for 73 that was passed uh, last year um, that looks to you know um, start a study on artificial intelligence and robotics in terms of you know um, the the benefits and harms that it could pose across the continent and so what much of what you see is you know a lot of what's happening um, in legislation across the continent looking at AI is in its very initial stages and progress is very very slow so there is need for other actors beyond government like you know civil society who are stepping in to come up with a number of frameworks so for example yesterday I was talking about um, a framework that I'm working on we are working on as policy with a number of partners and so it's just um, really civil society stepping in we know other partners like you know uh, the Tony Blair Institute and other players, you know, in, on AI across the continent doing a couple of things. So really, um, I'd say much of what's happening is really, really just around data protection, personal data protection. And so everything else in terms of just the other principles, looking at gender, um, risk impact assessments, um, even just, the, you know, environmental and just other principles are barely, barely being addressed right now. And so it's just, I guess, uh, interesting to hear what's happening um, across other regions of the world. And, you know, hopefully conversations like this can, you know, reach the people that uh, they're supposed to reach, especially in the African continent. And I would say just another issue is just uh, a lot of what has been happening. Also, there is just like opacity to it. We barely know what's happening outside these working groups in the AU and even at government level where we have national AI strategies. It's hard to access the data to be able to, you know, know the progress they're making and the steps they're taking. And so even with the recommendations we're coming up with, you know, looking at steps of implementation, you know, it, that's one of the barriers. How do we break through these working groups and be able to get to the top because it's a top-down model. So for us as civil society coming from the bottom up, um, so the, I would say that's pretty much what um, you know AI legislation right now looks like across the continent. Thank you. Thank you, Bobina. Uh, Juan Carlos, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Juan Carlos Lara. I represent Derechos Digitales, uh, an NGO working in the intersection of human rights and technology. I am based personally in Santiago de Chile. We have a regional reach. I'm very thankful to be a part of this session in a really multi-stakeholder panel uh, focused in the uh, majority world. And at the same time, I'm also pleased to be talking about something that is a bit uh, nearer to myself, which is my own country, Chile. Um, and to, to talk about uh, the opening questions about the regulatory framework for AI, I think uh, we need to acknowledge a, a couple of things. As, as an expert was recently saying, technology sometimes gives us a headache. Um, and the way in which it has been seen, however, in developing countries such as mine is as, a, as an opportunity for development and as an opportunity to be a part of a global conversation and, and global uh, chains of value where we can finally probably join uh, the countries that are at the forefront of uh, development and, and uh, also research on uh, digital technologies. Um, so that has a few consequences. First, that indeed Chile has a national policy on artificial intelligence that is supposed to run from 2021 to 2030. At the same time, uh, a, a, an, a plan of action was released, an action plan to implement this policy in different ways in, in that same amount of time. Um, at the same time, uh, between the, the launch of this policy and, and today, uh, there was a change in government. However, many of the people that were working in that document, in those documents really, uh, are still part of government and therefore we can 
hopefully see that some of these things, at least the positive ones, are taking into account. So I want to focus, uh, at least for this first intervention, on, on what this means for the establishment of a regulatory framework for AI. I think uh, the Chilean uh, experience can echo a lot of what has been said. Um, because of the policy coming from the Ministry of Science, Technology, Knowledge and Innovation, it has this positive view or mostly positive view where it's the, the purpose of the policy is not to set the boundaries of AI, but rather to set the stage and the capacities at the, at the national level to implement uh, AI uh, and at the same time to recognize that there are ethical and responsibility challenges to it without also um, uh, establishing or, or taking like a very strong stances on what the uh, regulatory frameworks for liability should be for AI systems. And secondly, the second, the flip side of this is that um, a, a policy that is mostly devoted to the conditions for positively developed AI in a country such as Chile, which is a small economy, um, the flip side is that some of these questions about how do we make uh, these systems accountable, how do we react institutionally to the harm that may happen, are questions that are still being debated, some of them, as it happens in other countries, within the framework of data protection reform. Uh, we have the oldest data protection law in the region, in the Latin American region. It's trying, it's being overhauled completely by a bill that has been in Congress for almost six years and another three years of discussion before it reached Congress. And some of these things on automation, profiling, um, and intelligent systems and large databases too, but that was left out at some point, are part of the discussion on data protection. And many of the, the rest of the likely impacts of AI are not necessarily addressed directly in the policy. However, um, it does set um, many recommendations and it has begun a, a lot of work already on uh, studying what should be done, what kind of regulatory changes are needed uh, to address, like to identify the problems, to identify local idiosyncrasies, how they connect to principles and ethics, and what kind of regulatory changes there should be. Uh, we can talk a bit more about all of that, but as uh, to finish this uh, first intervention, um, this policy is focused on the enabling factors for development of AI, the development itself, and also ethics, regulatory aspects, and socioeconomic impacts. This was subjected to public consultation. Uh, Derechos Digitales, my organization, has been critical about how these processes were conducted, even though there are many good things to say about them, uh, in the case of Chile as well. Um, but uh, we can discuss that a bit later. However, uh, I still believe that this openness, uh, because it was not required, still sets the stage to demand a bit more in the participatory processes for not just this AI policy, but in general for tech policy initiatives and hopefully for public policy in general to include uh, more voices and more uh, public participation. Uh, of course, again, I'm not a, a government representative. I'm rather skeptic about ethics as a one framework, but at least uh, seeing it from the outside, uh, the policy does acknowledge that there might be a need for studying and for uh, a deeper understanding of what the local needs are in order to see whether we need a framework for AI uh, that uh, requires changes in law. So we expect to see how that rolls out, but for now, these are my initial remarks. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Cynthia will conduct the next section. Cynthia? Hey, hope you can hear and see me, everyone. Thank you, everyone, our speakers, for providing us with this important overview regarding regulatory steps taken in your country. And that's very interesting because we see that some of the countries are a bit more advanced in terms of hard law. So as in Brazil and China, we see there either legislations or um, debates at the National Congress. And in other places, we see that there is only a soft law approach or even uh, discussions around uh, 
regulatory framework for artificial intelligence. In any case, uh, we see that uh, there is a lot of uh, connection with development and innovation when we talk about AI. However, if we are trying to design an ethical framework, we have to consider other aspects that uh, some of you mentioned here, such as uh, inclusion and open debate, public consultations. So this session now is intended to make you more questions regarding these aspects. So we can uh, compare how uh, these frameworks are being developed in your countries. So in this part, I will make you some questions, some specific questions uh, to address some issues that we raised during our conversations previous to this panel. But I will also remind the audience, the, the on-site and the remote audience that they can make you questions. So I will start by making the first question. And if there is a question from uh, the audience on site, please raise your hand and Alexandra will uh, get your uh, question. And also for the people who are following us uh, online, you can make questions through the chat. So don't hesitate to uh, make your question for our incredible speakers. So to start this part, uh, we will uh, ask Ismitri and then uh, Tiago can join. Uh, the first question is regarding stakeholderism and diversity. You mentioned that people are being um, included in the debates. However, we would like to understand how exactly because uh, in Brazil, for example, we have this issue that vulnerable communities and underrepresented uh, groups are not actually included in high level debates. So I'd like to ask you both uh, if and how diversity and mood stakeholders are taken into account in these regulatory debates. If you can give us example, or if uh, this is not a going on, it's important for us to understand that. So you both have around five to six minutes to answer this question, and then uh, I will proceed with the other questions. So Ismitri, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. I think that's a critical question in this conversation around AI governance. And, and I'd just like to break up this, uh, you know, the question of diversity and multi-stakeholder in this context that this can be looked at at multiple levels, right? So the first level is who has a seat on the table when the conversation is happening, when regulation or governance is talked about. Second is who gets to participate in the debate, not as an active participant, but as a respondent at least, and who has the capacity to do that. And the third, you know, the big debate around AI is, of course, which connects with who is doing the knowledge making in all of this process, right? Who is setting research agendas? whose data is being taken into account, how representative is that data. And in a context like India, given the diversity and the disparities in society, that is also a really, really important part of the debate, which ties more with the principles of non-discrimination and bias that we hear of in the AI context. But for the purposes of the present session, I'll focus and give you a few examples of the first you know, two kinds of participation uh, that you referred to in your question. So in terms of the different stakeholder groups, I think the conversation has certainly widened beyond the government itself. So it's not locked within the government, but it's not that it has widened to include all stakeholders, right? So uh, what I mean by that is that in terms of the government, the industry and parts of the academia, there is a lot of conversation flow that is taking place. There's a lot of management uh, and involvement of these stakeholders in the processes, in the documents, the committees that have come out, etc. Uh, for instance, a number of centers of excellence have been set up in technical institutes across the countries where startups, innovators, funders uh, and the academia are supposed to come together and have a conversation, think about innovation and research. Uh, there is something that called the uh, National AI Portal that's been set up, which is in collaboration with an industry association called NASCOM and the government, where uh, that is supposed to be the one-stop repository for everything AI in India, all reports, articles, everyday activities, case studies. So all of that is being recorded on that portal. 
But then coming to questions around, you know, who's on the table. Uh, so I want to give an example of the four committees. I said the Ministry of Electronics and ID had set up four different committees. And as I looked at the composition of those committees, all of them were either people working inside the government or they were people from the industry or people from academia. And in the academia, I actually want to make a distinction between, uh, you know, people working in the field of technical, the technical community and in the field of computer science versus those who look at these questions from a human rights, a social science, a humanities perspective. And what we've seen constantly in the composition of these committees, or even, you know, if they're not formally a part of the thinking in terms of who is thanked in the report. So for instance, the think tank in India, when they came out with their report, they acknowledged who was participated in the design of that document. And, uh, the you know, the first major stakeholder, the knowledge partner was the World Economic Forum Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution. But within India, the people who participated were academics from, again, you know, the engineering colleges, the computer scientists, uh, as well as people working in both Indian and foreign companies, uh, but all in a technical capacity. And there I want to you know, point to this gap between, uh, you know, the technical community or the research and academic community where there is this prioritization of expertise uh, coming from the technical side, which of course brings certain expertise to the table, but also brings with it certain, uh, you know, background and baggage. Uh, and therefore, because the conversation is not open to everyone uh, who represents different viewpoints from within the academic community, I think that puts a limitation to the health and the quality of the uh, academic engagement although it is happening uh, the other group which is you know noticeably missing is the civil societies so particularly those who are critical of uh, unchecked and widespread adoption so these groups are left to uh, you know question and talk at the periphery so they are not part of the formal processes we do get an opportunity to participate when these documents are put out for consultation and you know these are put out for discussion but there is often not enough transparency and I'm talking more broadly in the technology policy space. So beyond the AI debates, there is often a tendency that you invite comments, but you don't make those comments public. You also don't respond categorically and in detail to how those comments were addressed in subsequent versions of the draft. So for the people who are responding and a part of this process, we don't really understand you know, there is an input, but how is that shaping the output in any way? So there is a clear gap in that. And again, the even when the civil society participates, I think the conversation is more focused on the technology policy community within the civil society. So it's not that women's rights group or farmers rights groups who are traditionally doing, you know, non-technical things as their mainstream work are thinking about AI impact. And it's, it's because, you know, understanding AI and then translating it into the impact for your industry or your sector is certainly hard. And that responsibility i'm not sure whether it should lie only on the government whether it lies on people working in the you know technology policy community who should be doing this more actively but that's certainly uh, a gap that exists uh, and finally on your part about you know whether there are efforts about bringing in particular groups i think the only group where there are specific policies is towards the youth and there again it's about encouraging ai encouraging innovation and therefore involving the youth as designers and users of ai but but i think that has a long term impact because if you have people from grade 8 to 12 who are thinking about and understanding ai at that age there will be a subset of them who will also think about these issues more critically not all of them will be you know just doing hands-on development some of them will think about the big picture of the impact on society so i think that's certainly a positive move but in terms of other vulnerable groups in the indian context certainly from a gender perspective protected groups like scheduled caste scheduled tribes there is no uh, known effort or you know to bring them on board so it is public consultations might happen anybody and everybody who has the will and capacity will be able to participate but there aren't targeted initiatives to bring uh, some of these voices onto the table so I'll stop with that. Thank you, Ismitri. That's uh, very important to know. And I think this is, uh, that might be a common gap uh, among our countries because uh, it's very hard to include these groups uh, in the debates because as you said, we have seen that our government and the private sector are um, actually dominating the debate. And I think the, the thing here with this discussion is to raise this issue, right? Because uh, the most affected groups 
which are vulnerable groups, exploited groups, are not included. And we have to give voice to that. So uh, it's very important to raise this issue, to uh, make the word no, and especially because, as Juan said before, we are the majority of the world. So we have to uh, have our words heard and put these people uh, on the table to debate. And I am curious to know what uh, Tiago is going to say about Brazil, because we face uh, some of these issues here. So I'll pass the floor to Tiago to give us uh, his thoughts on this. Thank you, Cynthia. And yeah, uh, you, you brought to the table several topics that should be discussed. Uh, and I could say that I partially agree with you. Uh, so I, I'll try to make my point so you understand my perspective. And as a government representative, uh, I think it's important to remember uh, that Brazil uh, has some experience, at least in the field of internet governance, with multi-stakeholderism, which means we have a steering committee of internet governance with CGI.br or since the 95s. And this, I believe, is very important because somehow this brought uh, the idea of multi-stakeholderism and the, the importance that all stakeholders, all representatives at some level should be considered uh, to many of the legislations, for example, that we discussed in the Congress since our Internet Bill of Rights that we have, also our data protection legislation. And now this somehow, I will explain, happened in the AI Bill. That being said, and then that's uh, the, the, a point that I can agree with Cynthia, is that it's a very wide effort when you're talking about uh, such a diverse country as Brazil, which means, for example, uh, I've heard some criticism and I have to agree with that, at least at a personal level, that uh, indigenous people, for example, are not being considered. And uh, I mean, uh, they are a very important part of our country and we don't see their voices being brought to the table of these discussions. Uh, I think there's some effort in Brazil in the, uh, in the topic of uh, racial diversity and gender diversity, even though I know there's still room for, for, for criticism as well. I've heard criticism regarding that the gender diversity is still binary, and we know that we, we have to take in consideration also a more a wider spectrum on the topic, and also talking about racial diversity. Sometimes uh, in Brazil, we have a lot of subtleties regarding uh, the mixture of uh, the, the many uh, nations, uh, people that uh, contributed to our, well, uh, blood heritage, let's say like that. So these, these of course, bring challenges and this should be taken in consideration. Uh, I will just very briefly talk about the AI bill because I think that was an interesting experience to follow because uh, as you might have noticed, uh, the AI bill was proposed in 2020, and during that year, it was the, pandem the first pandemic year, and at some level, this made the discussion not very broad, because even though, okay, we have the internet, but how many people could have a good access to that, and how the discussions could be leveraged, which meant that uh, the economic sector, for sure, had a bigger role in that step, but in Brazil, and I believe most democratic countries, we have two houses in the Congress, the lower house and the higher house. So when the, the first version of the bill was passed to the higher house, uh, then it was where we were already in 2021. And then there was this uh, urge to have a wider discussion on the topic. And that's when the committee of experts, experts was uh, composed, and then they brought to the table more voices. Maybe not as many as it would be in, 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 uh, important for this such complex discussion, but I have to congratulate their effort in the sense that they try to bring as many as possible. And all of this is recorded in public so people can follow it, which is also very important for matters of transparency. And I finish here my this intervention and pass back to Cynthia.
Do we have any questions on the floor? Oh, now it works. Uh, well, thank you very much for the panel. Uh, actually, I have two questions. The first uh, would be more specific to the China case, which I have been following a little bit uh, in the last months. Um, and I heard that there were, uh, I, I recognize the, the, the legislation that uh, the panelists uh, informed regarding our algor uh, algorithm-specific systems, uh, especially, specifically the one related to recommendation systems. And um, it is more uh, an issue of like how its enforcement has been done. I, I read some articles that the, the government has already requested some information uh, from, the, from the platforms. And this information would mainly relate to algorithmic transparency. And I heard also that there would be some degree of discretionary with regards to which information would be requested. So if, if, if uh, Wayne could talk a little bit about this issue, like what is his thoughts about it would be very interesting. The other question, I think, would be more focused on the civil society representatives here. Um, it is to hear from you, like how and to what extent it, it has happened. If so, um, communities have been participating in the process of debating uh, AI system. Because um, in Brazil, we have, I am from Brazil, and we have been seeing some, some degree of participation, but mostly from organizations that are already part of this digital rights uh, agenda. Uh, but um, at least in our case, like uh, as Jago also mentioned, we have so many racial uh, aspects to be taken into consideration. The inclusion of indigenous peoples, which are not that much um, participating in the digital rights debate. So yeah, if you guys would have um, experiences to share about that, it would be very much interesting. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And I think that uh, Juan Carlos from the Editor Digitalis may answer this. And if someone else wants to jump in, just please go ahead. Juan Carlos, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the, the second question. The first one was directed to Wayne, so uh, I'll pass it on to him afterwards, uh, unless my civil society colleagues want to respond too. Uh, but um, so in the case of Chile, in the case of the national policy on AI, and we studied this and we published a report at Derechos Digitales, a couple important things happened, and I think it's good to um, highlight what was good about that process of consultation. Because it was subject to open consultation, the participation was much more open, and it was not just individual responses through a website, but also an invitation to produce, uh, to create self-organized meetings, which we, of which we also hosted one with external experts, so we could give feedback to that consultation process. And uh, as the representative of the Chilean government said a few days ago here at the IGF, um, some academics felt that uh, this was opening up the conversation to people that did not necessarily have the knowledge to be a participant, even though from the civil society standpoint, this is a good thing. Uh, if, and if there is any difficulty or n gap in knowledge to understand these processes or their subject matters. That's something that we should uh, fill, uh, but not prevent participation because of it. But uh, answering directly about our history with participation, we started this and yes, recognizing this, these good things about that participation, it was still on digital platforms and the affected communities on a day-to-day -day affecting technology are not just for people that are connected. It was not directed to people with disabilities. It was not directed in languages other than Spanish, even though we have very important indigenous languages such as Mapuzungun and Aymara and also uh, from immigrants such as Creole French from the Haitian uh, immigrants. And it was in Spanish in written form online. Um, also, and to finish my, my response to this question, in our study, the people who actually responded the online consultation were over 70% men. Um, so targeted, directed efforts to include or to be inclusive in the participation processes uh, were lacking. Uh, again, a, a huge acknowledgement to the advancements of participation. However, there's still a long way to go.
Thank you, Juan Carlos, for uh, your contribution to this debate. That's super interesting to, to know about it. And I think that way is uh, our next uh, speaker to uh, reply to the question that the audience made before. So please go ahead, Wayne, or if someone else wants to jump in, just jump in. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. I think, um, in terms of, in terms of the enforcement, I think uh, for example, I then know so far um, the CSA, the Cyberspace Administration of China, adopt uh, has adopted a lot of campaign-like enforcement uh, activities. For example, there China in China there is a, a routine uh, enforcement activity named the for example the Clean Cyberspace uh, uh, Campaign. Uh, it. I, th I think under some other authority, for example, the uh, Ministry of Industry and Information Technology also adopted this kind of uh, campaign-like activity as, as, as well. Um, those authorities basically um, uh, examine the, for example, some mobile apps as uh, data protection uh, uh, articles or, their, or even their programming codes, their uh, algorithms, their codes, uh, by examining those uh, codes or uh, or algorithms, the, the, the authority can understand how they uh, those mobile apps are enforcing, uh, uh, for example, did, uh, PIPL uh, articles, the Personal Information Protection Law, uh, as well as the some, some, for example, the algorithmic um, uh, recommendation system regulation, and this is the uh, so far I uh, the, 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 that's one of the one of the most uh, Often in, uh, informed uh, 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 scenarios in China, and another, uh, and I think the the later half of the questions related to the recommendation system regulation. Actually, that's true, just because um, even China released a guideline on algorithm register system. That means uh, I think this is uh, somehow resembles uh, that of. Uh, that in the European Union AI Act, there is some there are some articles relating to algorithm register system as well. Uh, basically, China has a in that guideline or the recommendation system regulation, China adopts a algorithm graded and class, classified system. And for example, it showed the I think there are at least five um, uh, categories of uh, uh, algorithms should be uh, 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 should be registered. The first, uh, let me check. I have some previous. I had some notes as well. For example, they uh, about about the um, uh, 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 the synthetic uh, generating algorithms were uh, were user profiling pers uh, personalization algorithms. And the ranking or sorting algorithms, and the filtering uh, algorithms, and some decision making or shattering algorithms. So China had uh, had uh, had this kind of uh, algorithm classified and graded system to to decide uh, uh, which algorithms should be registered with the authorities. Yes, uh, to save time, I think I will stop here. If you have any question, feel free. Feel free. Feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. <laughs> I think, thank you, Wayne. I think we have another question from the floor. You have to turn it on. Hello, hello. Thanks. Um, this is just a quick follow up to the second question. Um, my colleague from, from Brazil asked earlier, and it's really about um, the the multi staker multi stakeholder outreach and inclusion. Um, and my question is just, uh, you, you, Carlos, you touched on creating awareness and knowledge and understanding of I think what is a, a pretty complex subject, and you have stakeholders and target audiences who have a very low understanding and yet should be part of that process. So my question is really if, if our panelists have any specific examples of how 
either CSOs or government are, is really taking those very specific steps to engage with those audiences? Like what are there examples of, of outreach that has worked? Um, maybe not particularly with AI legislation, but other legislation that could be analogous to this particular problem set. Thanks. Uh, Bobina would like to answer, to, to comment. Um, I don't know with AI legislation, particularly in Africa, but I, I would say, for example, to the example I pointed to earlier, I don't know if you're in the room about the African Commission for Human and People's Rights, is it HPR, with a study that they're trying to take on regarding AI across the continent. I do know that they've tried to reach out to a number of stakeholders, you know, including, you know, like my other colleagues, the panelists were speaking about academia, um, civil society, and, you know, government, I think, like ministerial, ICT ministers and things like that. I, this is still in it. Initial stages, it hasn't taken off per se. I, I, like I said, there is a bit of opacity in terms of understanding how far the, you know the progress that you know these groups are making because it's coming from a very top level, the African Union and things like that. But um, I, you know, I would say that that's uh, where something I'd point to in terms of you know the multi-stakeholder approach that you know. Uh, AI legislation on the continent sort of looks like right now an example I'd point to. Yeah, I don't know if Carlos has something right there. Yes, very briefly. Um, in terms of connecting with groups, uh, the Chilean government actually had a good example through the national cybersecurity policy, the previous one, 2015, 2021, I think it was, um, where they actually gathered, reached out to groups and held... Um, focus groups uh, devoted to certain topics of that policy, which was highly technical, but it was also accompanied by a, an explaining document. That was very targeted and still somewhat narrow aside from a public consultation, but it still was guided by the government itself and not uh, left to the self-organizing uh, of, of people as it happens in the uh, AI policy. However, uh, this is not something that should only uh, befall uh, or some just for, for the government to do. Uh, in some cases, it can be started by them, but civil society organizations like mine are usually open. We actually promote um, uh, cyber capacity building in other subjects, and, and we also we reach out to, to do explainers on pieces of legislation or public policy all the time, especially to go against them. Uh, so to have that kind of collaboration to also explain things that are still subject to uh, public participation, I think is a good thing. Um, it also happens when uh, there are petitions uh, or there are uh, invitations to participate in, in common procedures basically everywhere for, from civil society. But still, I, I think there are many ways to collaborate towards that and to leverage the expertise and the public interest that is uh, cultivated by civil society, as well as the knowledge from academia as well. And, and of, of course, the knowledge from the private sector um, to engage further and also try to uh, provide more legitimacy and to include more voices in all of these processes, which can hopefully all serve to um, uh, improve the, the end results and the outcomes and not just to be a checkbox to tick or anything of the sort. That's it. Thank you. And I see that Dismitri here uh, that is online has her hands raised. So please go ahead. You can add on that. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to add quickly with some experience from India. So I think one uh, example of this and outside DI space has been the net neutrality campaign that happened in India a few years back. And that was really an example of something which, you know, was technical in nature, but turned into a mass movement because of the way the civil society organized itself and groups voluntarily came together. And again, I wouldn't call it like truly democratic in the way, uh, you know, the AI debate needs to be because you're again talking about a community which is already online and is aware of the impact, uh, you know, of 
non-net neutral activities, but it was really a public campaign, which did then end up having a visible policy impact. Uh, but in addition to that, we do see that whenever you know certain issues are put out for discussion, the technology policy community does end up uh, collaborating very often with gender rights group or health policy groups, which work in the more uh, traditional offline spaces and have grassroots reach and try and uh, you know convince them or uh, you know uh, do advocacy. But there. I just want to highlight that that does come with the risk that uh, when we, you know, use that kind of approach and the burden is on the civil society, then it, you know, obviously means that uh, the vision and the ideas and the risks that we perceive from the technology policy community do get transmitted and translated. And, you know, ideally, if someone was thinking about this bottom up from a different community, they may, uh, you know, have thought about risks differently or their priorities might have been different. So when that transmission rule is taken on by the private sector or civil society, there is that risk of, you know, values being transmitted along with that, which we need to be mindful of. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the floor? Sorry, Alexandra, I see that someone here from uh, the remote audience has her hands raised. Who would like to make a question or was it uh, by mistake? I think it was a mistake. No, oh, no. It's, a, it's a quick okay. question. All right, open your mic. Sure, thank you. Yeah. Okay. It's a quick question and the question is to Thiago from uh, the Brazilian government side. Uh, I do remember that uh, he mentioned about how there is transparency uh, efforts that are being done in terms of uh, consultations that happen in Brazil through that have happened recently in Brazil. I just wanted to know how post hoc uh, consultation transparency efforts work in terms of consultation. As in, uh, do do you see uh, people coming back? and then further engagement happening on, particularly on subjects that are very technical like AI. Are there people coming back, whether people outside of the maybe digital rights space or even students or other stakeholder groups who come back to these recordings maybe or try to further engage and is there, is there success whether when you look at it from the government's perspective and from a broader multi-stakeholder governance creation perspective. Thanks. Um, thanks, Sapni, for your question. And well, uh, what I can say is that uh, in, in Brazil, there is, yes, uh, some effort. And I would, I mean, I, I cannot compare, but I think it, it of course, has its issues. but. It has very good examples of what has worked. Uh, so we have a, a freedom information access uh, legislation, which I believe, and it's like 10 years old. And I think it has helped a lot to bring this culture of transparency, both actively and also passively. What I mean is that we have, for, for example, uh, some uh, portals, web pages where uh, society can can uh, gather information that is uh, provided by different uh, ministries or authorities like ours. So you, this information can be found of uh, the work has which has been done. But if it, that information is not there, there are also ways for you to request that information. Of course, uh, not every single information can be provided, there's classified information, sometimes there's personal data involved and these issues have to be taken in consideration. But uh, I believe there is some openness on that. What I could say uh, as a out criticism from the government side is that we still have a lot of issues with uh, not the, the, the start of the procedure, but the, the measure of it, like how a reachable or transparent systems being. So what I mean, we still have um, several challenges in the Brazilian government in general to measure uh, how we are really reaching people. Uh, I do believe it. this is partially because of technical capacity, which uh, talk about human resource in government. And I believe many other uh, fellows here have noticed the same issue in their countries that technical capacity is not 
always the, the best, especially because when you have that good guy, guy or girl, she eventually, uh, he or she eventually is captured by the private sector. So uh, what I mean is for sure there's room to improvement, but uh, the, the experience in Brazil uh, can, can be an, an interesting benchmark to know more about this. And uh, even though our authority is not the one that regulation this part of freedom information would be more than happy to intermediate any connections you want to do with the authority that deals with uh, this topic of transports in Brazil. Thank you, Tiago, uh, for answering the question. And I wish we could have more time to keep discussing this issue. However, to uh, open opportunity for some uh, other comments and uh, questions from the audience, I would like to know if there's any uh, one else that wish to make a question to our panelists, especially on site. Alexandra, I think there's uh, someone that wants to make a question. Can you check it? Hi. Uh, hello, I, my name is Elisa, I'm from Brazil. Uh, due to its potential to increase uh, inequalities and in discrimination to use of facial recognition technology for public security is very controversial and debated uh, worldwide. Uh, how, is, uh, how is this matter being perceived in IE regulatory discussion, discussions in your country? Uh, what, are your, what are your concerns about? I'd like to uh, hear you from Bobina especially. Thank you, and I will uh, pass the floor to Bobina to uh, give us uh, some thoughts on the issue of the use of facial recognition technologies in Africa in general. If you can uh, give us uh, your perspective, it would be great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, I Again, we'll just go ahead with the Africa-wide perspective and not just Uganda. And so, um, you know, I'd uh, mentioned from just a number of, um, we've seen facial recognition technologies deployed across the continent in a number of countries, Zimbabwe, Uganda itself, um, and um, these have, you know, been in the name of, you know, um, security and, you know, the like, but we've seen a lot of these technologies have actually, you know, ended up being, you know, mass surveillance tools and, you know, the like. And um, I would say a lot of, you know, uh, the discussion around this is, at least from what I know from a civil society point of view, you know, um, you know, uh, I'd say organizations like policy and, you know, other um, uh, civil society organizations across the continent, uh, you know, I'd say um, researchers, maybe independent researchers, academic researchers are the people talking about the issue and, you know, just, um, you know, highlighting the harms that are coming with these technologies. And so, um, yeah, briefly I'd say that's, that's what the, the issue looks like. I, I wouldn't say there has been like opposition in terms of like uh, mass participation where like the public has come out to like, I, I, I do not know of, um, you know, a particular country where, where, you know, the citizens have come out to publicly say um, rebel against the systems or something. What I do know is maybe about uh, the biometric systems um, of identification, for example, in Kenya. But yeah, that's that's what I'd say about that. Yeah. Uh, if I can respond also from the civil society perspective, in Latin America, we have a project at Derechos Digitales called Reconocimiento Facial Info, or like facial recognition info in Spanish. Uh, that tries to address this question also from the perspective of several countries. Speaking again uh, as the perspective that I came here to discuss, which is that of my own country, but also speaking about the experience that we have from the rest of Latin America, um, most of the discussion on facial recognition clashes 
uh, legitimate public interest in security with the fact that these are systems that are in many ways developed or acquired or implemented without proper legal safeguards and oftentimes also outside of, of any kind of legal permission. So what we have seen in the Latin American region is that regardless of any serious uh, regulatory debate, most of the discussion on facial recognition and its inadequacy uh, to safeguard human rights is it's something that is taken to courts oftentimes. It happened recently in the city of Buenos Aires. It has happened in Sao Paulo, as I'm aware. Uh, it happened unsuccessfully at one point for Derechos Digitales as well in Santiago de Chile. But it's something that um, the law is un has been unable to respond to properly. And that even frameworks that are related to AI still have the, the challenge to uh, avoid the carve-outs for public security that could allow for these kind of usage, not just of the automated auto automation technology, but also the exchange of databases that make a facial recognition possible as something that is that requires uh, a careful regulation, if not outright moratoriums in, in any case. Thank, Thank you, Bobina. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Sorry, Alicia. Were you going to say something? Yes, we have one last question from the audience. All right. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to ask the uh, question. And thank you again to the panel uh, to give this very informative uh, overview of how some of the uh, AI ethical frameworks work in your regions. I think it's very useful and very um, important to hear from um, the global south specifically because oftentimes when we talk about AI uh, development or um, ethical frameworks often comes from the global south. Um, oftentimes we talk a lot about the EU AI Act. Um, so uh, I, I have a question regarding the moving forward uh, progress because um, I've heard a lot about um, for example, in Uganda, the data protection, uh, all the way to uh, uh, China, the development or of um, the ranking of AI algorithms, and to Chile, Brazil, how to engage with the public. Um, I invite you to go from any perspective to go uh, talk about the progress moving forward. What do you think um, needs to be done uh, in the future of the AI ethical framework in the Global South, uh, either in your regions, uh, in your countries, or just overall? Thank you. Who would like to answer this? Maybe our online participants, speakers? Uh, if I may, I can go first, yes. Um, uh, thank you for the question. In terms of the progress or advancement, I think um, in turn, uh, considering the ranking system or recommendation system regulation, I think the biggest issue so far is uh, the, uh, the kind of the paradox between uh, transparency and trade secrets. For example, uh, just because uh, we cannot... Uh, Examine the algorithms in terms, uh, right? In terms of the trade, uh, trade, uh, trade secrecy, um, but uh, but uh, but uh, uh, that's the reason why you know, China is currently considering doing a kind of uh, a core regulation uh, model. That means uh, um, uh, the, the the government is inviting those. Uh, uh, I mean. So, from other stakeholders from the private sector and some standard making association or uh, even the, uh, the private sectors ESO. Just because somehow private sectors and they will, I believe that a private sector would normally collect the opinions from their own developers, for example. Uh, so that's the reason I, I, I think this kind of co-regulation model should be uh, uh, further in the near future. Uh, uh, yes, uh, so, but uh, but another, another issue is also uh, relating to the, the ownership of data or algorithms, just because in the current digital areas, we cannot own data uh, theoretically. 
uh, right, where we cannot own occurrences theoretically. Um, um, and so, uh, but, uh, but China would like to create this marketplace for data uh, because they would like to commercialize data and to promote the flow of data uh, across the nation. Uh, so I think the, the, those uh, those issues are should, uh, will be considered in the near future, and I think that will be uh, uh, the, the, the 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 biggest progress in the near future as well. I, I will stop here and hand the floor to other panelists. Thank you. Any other panelists who like to add on that? Yeah. Because we are coming to an end. Okay, go ahead, Tiago. It's very quick, sorry. Uh, because I, it's definitely a very interesting question, so thanks for it. Uh, I think there are several steps to, to be done, uh, at least I can speak from the Brazilian experience, but also at the global level. I think uh, AI frameworks, if they are not uh, able to be enforced, will never be enough. And on, the, on that topic, I think it's also time for smart regulation. And what I mean by that, uh, we know that uh, norms and uh, hard law cannot keep the pace with innovation because it takes a lot of time we have a lot of we need a lot of time to reach a consensus and even though even many times this is not reachable and we just get something because we need something done and what what i mean uh, i've been following uh, as a as my researcher hat i would say as on my academic part that uh, there are new uh, ways that have been promoted in this last five years six of uh, how to make public-private partnerships or uh, uh, meetings or discussions that could bring this to the table. And I'm talking specifically of programs like innovation hubs or, for example, hackathons, uh, regulatory sandboxes, and all of those, okay, they, 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 they have the specific characteristics, but what's interesting about, about them is that they give the opportunity for the regulator uh, and the public administration in general to get closer to the tech field. It gives room, if it's well designed, the methodology gives room to civil society and different groups to participate on the, on the process. Uh, but of course, all of those are tools, are instruments that if they are not well designed, they will still have issues of not being transparent or not bringing that so many people to the table. So I think in the end, we have to consider the tools, but also how to design them and how to implement them. Thank you, Wayne and Tiago, for your considerations. And this is indeed uh, super challenging because, as I said at the beginning, the use and development of AI systems is accompanied by this rhetoric of innovation and development. However, uh, we have to uh, open a space about the risks, uh, the impacts on fundamental rights, otherwise we will not go ahead uh, with this uh, innovation that we are expecting. So it's very challenging. And I think that we are leaving this panel with more questions than answers. And just to close uh, this panel, I'd like to mention something about facial recognition technologies because it's an important issue that we are facing also here in Brazil and taking the opportunity to add on the question that were made before, is that, uh, for example, as Tiago said, the government is worried about uh, instruments uh, to innovate and to develop the country. However, regarding the issue of facial recognition, for example, there is a huge uh, project uh, from the Ministry of Public Security that intends to monitor and use face facial technologies uh, for public security reasons. However, uh, the use of this technology is not uh, safe, is not uh, equal because uh, we do understand 
that there is the problem of uh, persecution and targeting vulnerable groups because especially of the structural racism that we are facing in Brazil and also worldwide. So it's very, very challenged. And I think that our mission here is try to think about uh, this balance between innovation and the protection of rights. So I think uh, also only to close, uh, LAPIN uh, developed uh, a, an extensive research regarding the use of facial recognition technologies by the public administration. And I invite you all to have a look. Uh, the work is available on our website. And also due to our um, role in this research, we had also uh, a partnership in uh, research with Access Now regarding the use of these technologies. So it's an important issue that we are raising attention to. And it would be great if you could uh, have a look. And we are also open to answer any other questions that were not answered here. So you can always contact LAPIN and I will leave the email here in our chat. So if you have any other questions or would like to make any comment regarding this panel, just feel free to reach out. And well, from my side, uh, I would like to thank you everyone, the audience and the speakers that joined us today in this important discussion. And I will pass the floor to Alexandra to close the panel uh, on site. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you for our online speakers and for our on-site speakers, also for the participation. And this session is now closed. Well, sorry, we didn't have the time to... Oh, I, I noticed the time, so... Ah, uh, Oh, Cynthia will not be available, right? I, I, I want to... She wanted a picture. Who? Cool.